everyone. On behalf of IntelliCap, I would like to welcome you all to the third day of 13th Sankal Global uh, Summit 2021. And at this year's summit theme of mainstreaming impact, we're happy to bring the session on healthcare, which is on blended finance supporting India's COVID-19 recovery and long-term health system strengthening to all of you. We're honored to have some of the best minds in the field of blended finance and healthcare with us today to deliberate on this topic. The session is crafted and supported by our program partner, Samrit, an initiative supported by USAID. Today's session focuses to explore how blended financing approaches can help to resolve complex healthcare challenges by understanding the merits and opportunity for innovative financing solutions as a means of closing funding gap, maximizing public health impact, and achieving global development targets. We have an interesting format for today's discussion where our panelists would be joined by a pool of experts and practitioners key discussants to share more insights on the key thematic areas. The session will be moderated by Dr. Nanda Kumar, and he will be joined by other panelists and speakers, uh, such as Ajay Rao, Avi Sheikh Gupta, Rupa Satish, Aparna Dua, Samit Jain, Monisha Ashok, and Rahul Mehra. Before we move on to today's panel discussion, I would like to invite Mr. Ashish Mendi, Project Director, Samrit Healthcare Blended Finance Facility, to set the context for today. Before we start, I would also like to put some housekeeping rule for the session. Please keep your audio on mute and post the question in the chat window, which we will be taking up towards the end of the session. Feel free to engage with the speakers through chat window. With this, I would like to invite Ashish. Ashish, over to you. Thanks a lot, Arundhati. Um, good evening, everyone joining from India and from across the world. Good morning, Dr. Nanda. Um, and good morning to everyone joining from the US. Um, we uh, at Samrit uh, are one of, uh, uh, you know, this is a project that is a uh, pioneering intervention for blended financing in healthcare. Uh, and we plan, the idea was to ensure uh, that we are able to use, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity created through the pandemic to reach out uh, and uh, to the entrepreneurs who want to make an impact by offering innovative solutions for solving some of India's um, long-standing healthcare problems uh, and give them access to affordable capital. Uh, while this was the thought, uh, USAID, uh, uh, IIT Delhi and NHA uh, came together to constitute Sandrit under Pahel, uh, which is housed in IPE Global. And uh, we are in the process of identifying and uh, investing in opportunities that would solve healthcare-related uh, problems uh, and help uh, entrepreneurs to reach out uh, reach out their solutions to the vulnerable communities. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? So the pandemic essentially uh, reinforced the fact that there are large gaps in healthcare uh, in India, but we wanted to focus on the problem of healthcare financing and how difficult it is for an entrepreneur to uh, you know, create solutions and yet make a living and make a, a, a you know, sustainable business model out of it. Uh, they have to compete with not just uh, the freebies offered by governments, but also some of the more uh, established players. So to make an entry into uh, the Indian healthcare space is quite uh, difficult and it's of always uh, you know, a challenge. So uh, the need, need, need we sensed was to create uh, that to have viable business models and support innovations, which will essentially uh, go on to uh, uh, foster the, uh, the innovations and entrepreneurship in healthcare. And some of the easier uh, problems are solved by uh, the entrepreneurs by taking on uh, and then take on larger challenges. Can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, in came Samrit, which is, uh, you know, utilizing philanthropic capital uh, and essentially making it, uh, making commercial capital affordable and accessible to uh, the entrepreneurs in India uh, who are focusing on healthcare uh, solutions, especially targeting the vulnerable communities. So it, this is a beautiful tri-sector, uh, you know, collaboration where we are working with the NHA to get access to their network of, you know, 25,000 plus private healthcare providers. We are using the commercial private capital and making making their, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that they are able to make it sustainable by offering uh, affordable financing 
to uh, the entrepreneurs uh, in the country. And also we have uh, access to philanthropic resources, which are used to uh, create structure, financial structures that help everyone involved in the ecosystem. So there is benefit that is accrued to uh, the, uh, uh, the entrepreneur, to the private capital, uh, as well as to the philanthropist. We, we, we aim to provide long-term solutions that, uh, that addresses the ecosystem at large and not just offer more, you know, specific solutions for specific problems. We want to increase access to institutional capital. We hope that we, our interventions will be able to increase uh, market access to the entrepreneurs and their solutions, especially targeting the vulnerable communities. We have a network of uh, industry experts that help us select uh, uh, innovations and solutions that are better targeted towards the communities. Uh, we offer uh, business advisory support to the entrepreneurs who often are mired in uh, problem solving and firefighting at times without uh, getting an opportunity to look at the larger picture. Uh, we, we use our platform uh, to advocate policy uh, because we are also working with governments at the state and the national level. Can you go for the next slide, please? Samrit is uh, a mission uh, uh, to uh, ensure that we are able to directly reach out to 25 million plus people. Uh, we, uh, the idea is to support uh, 30 to 40 uh, innovative uh, healthcare solutions with high impact. Uh, we are in the process of mobilizing an investment pool of uh, up to $100 million uh, and raise philanthropic capital of up to $50 million uh, and strengthen the healthcare services, especially targeting the vulnerable population of India. We, we, are, we have created various blended financing instruments such as concessional capital, cash collaterals, returnable grants, uh, assistance grants, and so on and so forth. And through by bringing the philanthropic capital with uh, blending it with commercial capital, we hope that we'll be able to create financial structures that will help uh, the businesses to find, uh, uh, find the vulnerable, vulnerable population uh, uh, as a target for their business growth. Next, please. So how does blending actually work? Uh, we see that uh, we have uh, uh, we have commitments from USAID. We have we have large commitments from uh, Rockefeller Foundation who have contributed to the grants pool, uh, and these pool uh, these funds are pooled in IIT Delhi. Uh, and we also have uh, tie-ups with Indusind Bank. We have DFC uh, uh, Development Financial Corporations having uh, made a commitment for evaluating some of, supporting some of the solutions. Caspian Debt is an important partner for us, and we are in the process of identifying various potential investors. So the idea is to merge the intent of impact capital uh, as well as philanthropic capital, and helped by uh, you know the National Health Authority, IIT Delhi, we are able to screen uh, uh, great so solutions that are able to target the vulnerable communities. We have supported uh, oxygen-related uh, solutions. Uh, we, we have created uh, critical medical care facilities during the pandemic. We have supplied ventilators, made in India ventilators. Uh, we have looked at various vaccine supply chain solutions over the last uh, three, four months and so on and so forth. So we, the idea is to ensure that while we work for the immediate assistance of COVID, we are also building the long-term resilience within the healthcare ecosystem in the country. Next, please. Uh, we are partnering with uh, the National Health Authority, which of course is uh, the body that uh, has the Ayushman Bharat, that rolls out the Ayushman Bharat program or the PMJY program in the country. They have a network of uh, 25,000 plus private healthcare uh, service providers, which we hope uh, to provide as a ready market for the solutions that, that we support. IIT Delhi is an institute of eminence and we partner with them they help us in identifying and uh, curating some of the technologies uh, uh, and work, we, they work with us to help the technology solutions to fine tune their products and uh, target the vulnerable communities. Uh, we are working with the principal scientific advisor to the government of India as a part of the Oxygen Consortium, which is a 300 crore initiative to address various oxygen related uh, problems that was sprung up during the pandemic, but uh, this is a more long-term intervention to ensure that uh, there is enough oxygen security uh, going forward into the healthcare uh, ecosystem, both public as well as private. Next, please. 
So the idea is to mobilize. Samrit plans to mobilize, uh, you know, financial resources. One one aspect is the philanthropic capital. Philanthropic capital we plan to raise up up to fifty million dollars over the next two years, and use that as leverage to make commercial capital, uh, you know, affordable and accessible to the entrepreneurs and various projects in the healthcare space. We have an expert team, uh, uh, ably helped by the uh, uh, you know experts in IIT. To uh, IIT Delhi to identify uh, healthcare solutions, uh, fine-tune the offerings, and uh, use those uh, you know nuanced uh, solutions for the vulnerable communities across the country. The the uh, the, uh, the affordable capital or various uh, financing structures that we create will uh, you know essentially support uh, these entrepreneurs to take their uh, businesses. to the next level support them for commercial validation give them support for various operate operational as well as for manufacturing uh, practices and uh, help make it make their path to sustainability a little bit more easier uh, the uh, we have we have successfully established a, a robust monitoring and evaluation framework we have an in house team that looks at impact and leverage that is being uh, created by the uh, by these solutions that we support and going forward we plan to work with independent uh, agencies as well to ensure that we are bringing in the best knowledge and capturing the uh, best impact across the country through the interventions that we support next please we use various types of instruments uh, we have used uh, plain vanilla grants concessional capitals uh, returnable grants to uh, ensure that during the emergencies we are able to support uh, some of the solutions to launch their products to ensure that their services reach the needy uh, in 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 uh, you know at the right time uh, we are also uh, you know evaluating various portfolio guarantee uh, schemes uh, uh, first loss guarantees uh, to uh, for uh, entrepreneurs and for companies that need uh, immediate capital Uh, so that they are uh, uh, they are able to uh, you know cash collaterals is one one more uh, uh, opportunity that helps uh, companies free up their working capital and use it for operations so there are various other structures in uh, that are being created customized at times uh, along with our uh, you know tech partners and the entrepreneurs to see to it that all uh, their needs are met uh, at the in the quickest possible time Uh, uh, the funding that is being deployed is essentially for a scale up and building up on uh, established uh, uh, solutions uh, preferably uh, which are not in the pilot stage <laughs> we we invest uh, anything between uh, uh, half a million to 1.5 million dollars in each project however some of the better projects uh, with which have promise of larger impact uh would also uh, uh, qualify for uh, uh, larger investments uh, currently the tenure of the uh, samrit uh, facility is for 2 years however we uh, hope to uh, raise capital and rope in investors to see to it that uh, you know this is a more long term solution uh, that is being uh, that is available for uh, the entrepreneurs in the country Uh, we hope to create uh, you know to touch at least 25 million lives uh, and be uh, based on some of our investments over the last 6 months uh, we are on track to you know hit those targets well in time next please a uh, providing a snapshot of uh, you know the investments that we've made last year uh, samrit came to sankalp as a concept uh, uh, as a as a as an idea which where, where the team was invested and was creating a road map to blended financing for healthcare uh, i'm proud to say uh, there was a lot of hard work that the team has put in uh, a lot of experts have joined the team and created uh, you know a, a, a solid proof of some of the investments uh, that we've made already in the last 6 months or so and they have started to show positive impact on ground and we'll be of course speaking to awl and plus uh, during uh, during the course of the day uh, who have created uh, nuanced supply chain solutions primarily get targeted towards covid but these are solutions that will go well beyond covid that can they can be used for uh, you know uh, so awl uses Uh, you know creates warehouse temperature control warehouses so one can use them not just for covid vaccines or medicines but for other pharmaceutical and uh, you know non pharmaceutical uh, uses as well 
So we are working with Wellspring. Uh, everyone has heard of uh, Healthspring, uh, which is a primary healthcare uh, chain uh, in urban areas. Uh, what our intervention has done is we are able to convince them to take this, uh, you know, model of modern and uh, well-facilitated primary healthcare center to an area which does not have uh, any primary healthcare uh, support. So uh, Wellspring is now create, creating uh, 50 to 60 uh, primary health care centers uh, in locations which, uh, which are at least 50 to 60 kilometers away from the nearest government uh, primary, uh, government nearest facility for uh, primary health. Uh, so in, they, they, there is a business model that they are also working on. They plan to tie up with uh, you know, local uh, manufacturing units, uh, local co corporations, and uh, ensure that they become sustainable uh, going forward. Uh, and plus technologies is, is, a, is a phase change material that is being used for uh, supply chains. But the idea that we supported them was for uh, taking them from possibly an AWL warehouse to, the la uh, to connect them to the spokes for then last mile delivery of vaccine. But again, these, these materials can be used for transportation for uh, any temperature sens uh, sensitive uh, consignment that we need. Uh, we offered them, offered these solutions emergency response funding, which, is, uh, an, uh, which was a type of an award for enabling them to work and address some of the uh, emerging uh, or pertinent needs for addressing the pandemic. But we have also created various uh, financing structures uh, with our deck partners uh, so that they are then able to uh, you know, build on you know, the, the work that they already have established and are able to you know, fulfill some of the needs in the country and abroad. Uh, especially with AWN and Plus, we are, uh, we are offering them uh, access to the African market as well through our partners in Africa where they are they will be supported to uh, uh, to explore those markets set up distribution channels possibly set up manufacturing units and uh, you know uh, address the uh, and bridge the gaps in supply chain for uh, healthcare in some of the countries in africa next please so over the last year or so since we last in, uh, last we presented at samrit have there been uh, any learnings of course there have been the journey itself uh, has been a learning. We uh, post, uh, uh, you know, the presentation at Samrit last year, the, the FCRA guidelines changed. So we had to rework and, uh, you know, modify our approach and ensure that there, there are uh, right uh, channels available for uh, the philanthropic partners from abroad to invest in uh, a blended financing uh, concept in India. Again, uh, blended financing as such, is, uh, is a very jargonized and complicated concept. Uh, and it's not well received by, uh, more, by the uh, entrepreneurs uh, and the industry as such. So it, that, that, was, that was a learning where we, need to, we had to uh, break down some of the uh, you know, concepts uh, and de-jargonize the approach and ensure that we are able to make a foray into uh, the healthcare uh, you know, entrepreneurs and, they so, and support those solutions. Uh, the impact that we are able to create has been uh, a learning in itself over the last um, uh, few months. The transactions generate both financial as well as social returns, and we are we are still uh, trying to envisage how both of them can uh, you know work hand in hand. How a social impact can also create financial impact for the entrepreneur, and uh, he does so that he sees a viable business model in the uh, vulnerable communities. Uh, leveraging uh, philanthropic capital is uh, is a challenge that uh, uh, again the philanthropists themselves would need to understand uh, and would need more uh, you know time. Uh, most of them demand we need to see some impact. Uh, so last year when we were approaching uh, uh, you know potential partners, they were not confident of uh, you know looking at this because it was still at a concept stage. Today we are confident and we are able to showcase the initial impact that we have been able to achieve over the last few months. Uh, and that shows promise. The numbers are, look very promising. We are already hitting uh, uh, close to 10 million uh, lives uh, directly impacted through our interventions over the last six months. So uh, over time, I'm sure uh, the foundations and philanthropic capital will see a lot of value in uh, uh, using 
the platform offered by Sundrit to make uh, uh, you know uh, investments into the healthcare ecosystem in India. Uh, another aspect that we have picked up over the last year or so is, is uh, while entrepreneurs um, are busy uh, creating solutions, they often are not able to uh, you know navigate the various uh, whether it's a government or the private uh, uh, the markets. And we hope that we are able to open up new channels uh, uh, for the entrepreneurs through our support. We hope that we'll be creating uh, a marketplace where uh, the entrepreneurs are able to access uh, some of our, uh, through our partnerships, a, ma a larger market uh, for them to make, uh, you know, uh, uh, sustainable, offer sustainable solutions and affordable solutions to uh, the healthcare service providers across the country. Next, please. Uh, so where are we uh, uh, and where have we uh, reached over the last six months or so? Uh, ever since the second wave, uh, we have invested close to $7 million uh, and I, we have identified 14 uh, high impact solutions and they are active in 17 plus states across the country. We have supported, our support has been able to you know, create value at 1200 plus healthcare facilities. Uh, we have trained uh, and connected with close to 15,000 uh, healthcare workers, community health workers, uh, and the nursing staff. We have upskilled them, trained them to ensure that they are ready uh, when or if the, the next uh, surge in COVID cases hit. Uh, they are also prepared for, uh, we are upskilling them for non COVID purposes and making them aware that there is a need for continuous upskilling and you know, training in the profession that they are. Uh, so currently we are targeting to reach over, uh, uh, the plan was to reach to 25 million, but we are on track to reach over 30 million lives over the next um, year or so. Next please. So I would like to then uh, invite uh, Dr. Nanda and you know, he's been a great uh, guide for us uh, in you know, guiding some of our investments. So I'd like to invite him to, you know, uh, invite uh, views from uh, the panelists and take this forward. Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks, Ashish. I think so. Before we move to uh, Dr. Nanda, I would also like to uh, take this opportunity to also introduce the panelists um, and uh, uh, people who have joined us today for the session. Um, just. So uh, as you all know that uh, the session will be moderated by uh, Dr. Nanda and uh, Dr. Nanda uh, is an internationally recognized health financing expert with known specifically for his work in resource tracking, health financing and healthcare policy and research. He began his career in Indian administrative services before becoming an academic physician. And Dr. Nanda is a professor of the practice at Brandeis University along uh, with director of the PhD program at the Heller School of Social Policy. Uh, he was also appointed as the first chief economist at the Office of Global AIDS Co uh, as a global, global AIDS coordinator. Prior to that, Dr. Nanda served as first chief economist for the Global Health Bureau at USAID. Um, we have Ajay Rao with us, who's an experienced impact investor in emerging and frontier markets, specializing in healthcare, agribusiness, and financial institutions. He also has experience in port infrastructure and small and mid-sized enterprise-focused debt fund funds. Prior to his current position at the Regional Managing Director for South Asia in the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, I just served as a director on the DFC's uh, Social Enterprise Finance Team, uh, um, originating and underwriting investments worldwide, including Georgia, Kenya, Mongolia, Nigeria, India, and Pakistan. Uh, prior to DFC, OPEC, Ajay was a small business banker at Citibank. Um, we have. Ms. Rupa Satish with us, who's country head in corporate uh, and investment bank and investment bank. Uh, Rupa Satish is an alumna of IMS Lucknow and is a career banker with close to 30 years of banking experience across domestic and multinational banks in the corporate banking domain. She's currently part of the co-management team at Indus in Bank. An avid green thinker, Rupa has formulated the ESG lending policy for the bank, integrating ESG risk into bank's lending process and filtering out high ESG risk companies. She set up Impact Investing Unit for providing debt to social enterprises. 
The unit has developed a unique partnership approach, collaborating with development finance institute, multi-development banks, impact funds, and foundations to create customized lending products and scale up access to debt. We have uh, Mr. Abhishek Gupta, who's investment director and head Caspian Debt. Abhishek has enabled financing investment in over 150 early to growth stage companies, working towards positive social and environmental impact across a wide variety of sectors, including healthcare, food and agribusiness, financial inclusion, clean energy, and et cetera. Prior to Cap Caspian, Abhishek helped set up a full some uh, structured financing business in small business lending and an affordable housing finance sector. He's worked on a wide range of financial products, ranging from pure debt to quasi equity, as well as structured products like securitization and pool transaction. Um, next with us is Ms. Aparna Dua, who's director at Asha Impact. She's part of leading leadership team at Asha Impact, an impact investing and policy and advocacy platform set up for some of the India's most res respected business lender, private equity veterans and philanthropists. She leads the policy work at the firm, enabling tri-sector collaboration between government, startup investors, and civil society across sectors such as affordable housing, waste management, education, and skilling, as well as on capital enablement reg regulation for social enterprises. Aparna is also leading advocate for innovative financing in India, helping crowd in commercial capital to support nonprofit to scale their efforts. Apart from these panelists, we are also joined by uh, key discussants who are experts and practitioners. And um, um, to start with, we have Monisha Ashok, who's Market Ex uh, Access Advisor at USAID, Center for Innovation and Impact in the Global Health Bureau. She applies private sector approaches, including strategic planning and marketing, market shaping to address pressing global health challenges. She leads CII's work on value-based care which explores innovation and measurements, delivery and payment mode that improves patient center outcomes. She also leads CII's work on innovative financing, which includes outcome-based and blended financing model that increase efficiency and catalyze private investment for global health innovation. We have Mr. Samit Jain with us, who's MD plus advanced technology. Samit started his career with Tata Access Bangalore and worked both in Hawaii and Los Angeles in the area of network communication five years before returning to India. He has been actively involved in various capacity in all the functions at PLUS since 2003. Currently, at, as an MD at PLUS, Summit heads the overall strategy marketing and finance portfolio. He aims to make PLUS stands out on the world in, uh, innovation map through its work focused on thermal energy storage. And last but not the least, we have Mr. Rahul Mehra with us. Rahul Mehra is a renowned supply chain management leader who is the CEO of an established organization in AWL India that stands solely on the foundation of quality and in-depth diligence. With his hand on global project management, logistic operation, business development operation, procurement leadership, and risk analysis management, he is believed in producing quality for customers and revenue for company threshold. I'm aware that all of you must be eagerly waiting to hear more from the panelists. So without much of uh, ado, I would uh, first, like to thank all the panelists and discussants for joining us today, and would now like to hand it over to Dr. Nanda. Thanks, Arundhati, and, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, based on where you are, uh, where you are located. Uh, it is a real honor and privilege <clears throat> to moderate this panel. We have an amazing group of experts and discussants. And so, without uh, wasting any time, because I really want us all to hear and learn from them. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, uh, Rupa Satish, and the format will be that I will pose a question to each of the panelists. We'll have a key discussant, and then I will open up uh, for other panelists and discussants to share their views as well. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover, some very important questions. So Rupa, the first question to you, uh, given your experience and expertise is, uh, what are some of the challenges and constraints um, you see that traditional lending institutions face in lending to the health sector. And how do you see blended financing help overcome some of these constraints and fundamentally transform and catalyze the development of health sectors in India? Over to you, Rupa. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of the event. So jumping straight into the topic, um, 
I hope I'm not hated for saying this in a healthcare seminar. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, you know, commercial banks like us have struggled really when it comes to keeping pace with an industry like healthcare, where there are so many innovations which are coming. So on the one end, it is a traditional uh, mature industry, as we call it, with stabilized cash flows. And you see large players. And on the other end, we also see continuous innovations in that space, in that sector. And so a little bit of a startup nature uh, comes uh, is seen in the industry uh, when we look at the industry overall. And of course, the unpredictability of cash flows is impossible to judge uh, at, at that level. That is the foremost challenge in risk. Uh, the, other, the other challenge is uh, often that I face uh, in this sector is that it is typically a capital intensive structure, uh, uh, sector uh, requiring some long gestation. So uh, you need a little bit of uh, a capital support uh, to you know, uh, make sure that um, the business model is got right uh, when an entrepreneur is uh, setting up his uh, enterprise in the sector. And invariably, I find that when it comes to affordable healthcare, uh, 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 you know, I have seen very many fantastic solutions, but uh, it, it becomes very difficult for us to uh, really gauge uh, whether um, uh, at, at a per unit level, even if it is extremely profitable, uh, because of the large investments that are made, will they be really able to scale? Because when companies try to take debt and scale up, and then they don't follow it up with enough equity raise, uh, we have seen multiple uh, cases in the industry which have collapsed because of over leveraging here. Uh, so these are typically the challenges. And then the third challenge is, of course, the security related, uh, because while there are securities, when you actually when things go down and when you go to take the medical equipment, it may not be there because it is a movable asset and it can be, you know, dislocated from uh, what you, where you originally invested it. Uh, also, it's horribly priced, so the risk return uh, balance uh, in the sector uh, is not adequate. So these are broadly, broadly the challenges. Super, thank you so much. I mean, if I were to I just got a 101 in, 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 in this topic, but what you were highlighting with was the very nature of the industry. You have the startups, you have the well-established, it's capital intensive, uh, you know, the, the price point and scalability becomes a problem. And then, and then you, you have this whole question of, uh, you know, the risk profile of some of these innovations and interventions. So it makes it a very complicated and complex market for traditional lenders to invest in. So my, my follow-up question really was, how do you see blended financing actually help address some of these problems? Right, right, right. So, uh, so in this end, uh, which is why I, 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 feel, I find blended finance very useful. So if you, if you gather from my last conversation, two aspects really, the risk element and the return element are both can be mitigated well with blended finance coming in. So on the risk side, how blended finance really helps us and which is why in the impact financing unit, we rely more and more on partnerships uh, with uh, institutions is that as you, as everybody knows, there are multiple types of investors with different uh, types of capital. So somebody who is a little more patient, when he comes in and uh, he provides uh, the bank a little bit of a cushion uh, and, and the runway that I spoke about. So if you have a grant, for example, USAID's current summit program also, then they release a grant. It gives that company some stability because they can then use that grant and achieve a sustainable model. And then the bank lending can come on top of it. So it helps me mitigate that startup risk to some extent. The other way in which I have seen and we have used uh, blended finance uh, very well is by a first loss default value. So uh, the risk appetite sometimes when you take debt and you're scaling up uh, is, is, the, is that the element of a loan that you would like to give and the risk that you want to take, the amount of loan that you want to give and the risk appetite, there is an imbalance there. So 
So when that happens, when you have a first loss default guarantee, uh, invariably, and, and especially if it is attached to a portfolio of healthcare companies. So with USA, for example, we were very uh, fortunate to have signed down a portfolio approach. And if you have a portfolio of healthcare companies, then, and, and, and if you're lucky to find a partner which provides you a first loss default guarantee, then your risk taking uh, really, you know, uh, comes uh, very, uh, com can, you know, can really be uh, good in that, in that portfolio. And thirdly, uh, the pricing. So when you have institutions like USAID come in and provide guarantee, the capital allocation from the bank towards such kind of guarantees and such kind of exposures drops very sharply. That allows us to price it competitively and my return on capital improves. So these are some of the, uh, there are many, many others, but these are the top benefits that I can think of. And we'll discuss it more later. Thanks, Rupa. Rahul, uh, as a discussion, would welcome your thoughts on what you just heard and on the question as a whole. Uh, thank you. Thank you, all the panelists. And uh, Dr. Nandakumar, thank you for uh, uh, bringing out this uh, relevant topic. And uh, uh, the points which you have highlighted, uh, Dr. Rupa Satish, I think they're pretty much uh, relevant. And I have a personal experience because uh, uh, I believe, uh, you know, how big the country is. We are the seventh largest geography and uh, uh, almost second most populous country in the world. And uh, most of the people uh, uh, and most of the geographies are uh, beyond reach. And uh, this pandemic, because COVID-1 last year uh, was an eye-opener in terms of, uh, because I had a vision that the company was a AWL, which we thought would be the masters in air, water, and land. And we had a punchline that moved with us to make a difference. But to be honest, 2020 and 2021 was the year when we really we, we really made a difference. Because COVID-1, uh, I believe I was approached by Ministry of Health, Government of India. Uh, I think April, uh, we had a lockdown, March 22nd. And I was approached that uh, the entire uh, supply chain is in a mess because uh, we had multiple programs like Mary Saheli and all that stuff, but we could not reach to 2.5 crore health workers. And uh, what they wanted was that both uh, in terms of uh, health workers uh, and in terms of the supply, they wanted a visibility. And um, I, I believe uh, considering the size of our country with 736 districts to be covered and over uh, in course uh, run into uh, thousands, it was not an easy job. So the primary job was to get involved, get up, set up the centers, create a system, which we did uh, in four days time, because we, uh, we had to uh, first integrate the entire IT system. We need to bring in all the suppliers on board who were involved in the PPA kits. And uh, uh, it, it required, uh, in, it, you know, it requires capital. And uh, thanks to uh, some of the points which you have highlighted, uh, the USAID and uh, the other uh, blended finance team which we are talking about, uh, it gave us such a uh, such an edge uh, in terms of our time, in terms of our speed uh, to be prepared, uh, and to reach almost uh, the number of beneficiaries and the lives which we touched uh, over the last uh, two years. Because uh, COVID one, we could uh, reach health workers. Uh, COVID-2 was uh, all of a sudden, no one was prepared, but it was much more complicated uh, because it involved life-saving vaccines. It involved uh, noble drugs like Tocilimazab, remdesivirs, and uh, oxygen concentrators, ventilators, where everyone pitched in. And um, that, that is where the last mile delivery played an important role. Because two to eight degrees, uh, stating India, which we all know, uh, easier said than uh, done, but uh, was very, very difficult to create an infrastructure, which I think last few, um, almost two quarters, uh, we, have, we have been successful. And uh, we have been, this is something which we are working on is now on the pediatric front, because government of India wants uh, that there might be a third wave, uh, God forbid if it happens, but uh, we need to be ready for the pediatric ICUs, pediatric uh, um, um, uh, boards, and we need to create a setup that we can even, uh, to reach and uh, uh, actually impact almost uh, more than 25 million kids who are there uh, uh, who would want uh, emergency drugs, who would also want the vaccines to reach them. And uh, this, this uh, 
uh, blended finance actually uh, worked as a catalyst. I would say because yeah, we were established, but uh, to create a coaching infrastructure uh, in such a short time, uh, I think this is playing up. This is uh, ideally something which I would recommend that uh, uh, this this helps a lot of uh, entrepreneurs like us. Uh, um, so uh, that's what uh, Mr. Nanda Kumar, I, I would uh, want that uh, um, while we are talking about other things which we have in mind, like drones and deliveries to remote areas where we can't uh, get there, some of the most remote areas uh, like Leh, Ladakh and other places. So we are working on some other uh, uh, aspects as well where blended finance uh, uh, is, we are, we are really aggressively looking at and uh, taking it up to our next step. Rahul, Rahul, thank you so much. I mean, this is uh, what, what is becoming clear is that for a very, very small investment, and but a very strategic investment, right? The, the the lenders, the entrepreneurs, the social impact, all of these things can be brought together, and you can create an environment that is truly uh, vibrant and transformative uh, in terms of reach and innovation. So it's it's incredible. Yep. Would, would anyone else from the panel uh, want to? Say a few words on the first question before I move to the second question. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to add one more thing, if I can. Uh, sorry, Aparna. Just, no, no, please go ahead. You know, you know because Rahul uh, spoke about COVID and I, I didn't touch about COVID. And ironically, COVID has, uh, you know, really uh, upset uh, the hospital cash flows extremely badly, at least the initial phases. And um, one would have, because, you know, the surgeries, et cetera, got postponed uh, significantly. And uh, while now, and, and most hospitals started uh, conserving cash and uh, uh, their liquidity, uh, there was an issue. Like you mentioned, supply chain was an issue. So that's what we saw in the, you know, initial uh, phase of COVID. Uh, now things are much better, I would say, in the industry. Uh, I think more equity and debt is coming in uh, and people are preparing for expansion and growth as the economy is kicking in. So we are quite positive uh, about the sector and the opportunities that we will see. Now, I think the hospital sector has now, uh, you know, uh, got, got itself organized. That's all from my side. Sorry, Aparna, thank you. No, no, thank you for, for that, Rupa and uh, Rahul. I think really great points in trying to, uh, you know, put out what the challenges are. I think just a quick point that I'd like to make here as well is, um, you know, outside of COVID as well, when you, and you know, Rupa, you really articulated this well, you have the traditional healthcare sector on, on one side, and then you have all the innovations. Uh, you know, what we've seen really at, at ASHA as well, and why we kind of made, you know, blended finance our focus as well, is there's this entire, uh, you know, missing middle, and, you know, that gets talked about quite a bit, where you have, uh, you know, really enterprising, uh, you know, people like like Rahul, and we have Samit here as well, who are doing fantastic work to try and reach out to the billions who, you know, um, are not really getting catered to by your traditional healthcare, uh, you know, systems, whether it's on the government side or on the private side, right? I mean, we, we can, you know, have another one hour long conversation and understanding why the government healthcare uh, system is, is not really, uh, you know, uh, being, being very active or, you know, where the private sector is perhaps failing, but that's really where you have a lot of social enterprises or just, you know, uh, innovators coming up, you know, startups that are filling in this gap. And that's where we see blended finance really, uh, you know, playing the role uh, by, you know, creating these blended capital stacks really bringing in impact investors, bringing in commercial investors once the business model is more established, but also, uh, you know, using philanthropic capital much more strategically to, to make healthcare, um, you know, accessible and affordable for the billions who currently are not getting service. So, uh, you know, outside of COVID as well, I, I feel like this is a segment that could get really well addressed through, uh, you know, blended finance approaches. So just wanted to make that, that point. Thanks, Aparna. I think Ajay, you you wanted to, uh, you know, you had some ideas as well. You wanted to share. Thank you, uh, Dr. Linda. Certainly, and I think you know, Rupa has so much experience in the sector, and she stated it so well. Um, I just wanted to kind of uh, bring a little bit color. So on on gestation, um, absolutely right. I mean, if you're looking at a tertiary hospital um, that's greenfield, that takes you know four to five years 
to uh, bring up the footfalls in order for that hospital to have the cash flow to start paying off a loan, right? Just to, to provide you that context. And what, you know, that, that's a lot of risk for a commercial, a traditional commercial bank to take. Um, and uh, second on uh, risk and collateral, um, in addition to the machinery, which, you know, has a certain limited life, very well stated, um, uh, there's, you know, if, if you have, if there's a default and you have to take possession uh, of a hospital, that's a, that's a social asset, right? And, and that was put there for a social purpose to, to serve that community. So, you know, we as, as a DFI want to see that hospital built, that developmental impact. We don't want to hold on onto the asset. So those are some of the constraints when thinking about at the outset, okay, uh, is this going to succeed? Right, and so that's why that kind of gives us some pause. And I think, as far as you know, solutions, um, we could talk about you know partnerships, building the ecosystem, building other other players in the market to offset some of those risks for the long gestation period. Um, in other cases, you know, if you have a university hospital system that's doing an expansion, looking at alternatives to collateral other than that hospital itself, but maybe you know, another, another property. Um, and then, um, you know, and, and this, so those are some of the, the ideas that, you know, we've seen out there in the environment. Thank you. Ajay, this leads wonderfully into the second question. And one of the things that we've been talking about is the need for partnership, right? And, and people coming together to make the whole work. So the question to you, Ajay, is, um, you know, why do you feel partnerships are very important uh, to mobilize, you know, this kind of capital to address social issues in the health sector? And what are some, from your experience, uh, what are some of the characteristics of a good partnership and what makes a partnership work really well? Well, I'm going to call it, um, it takes a financial village, really, to um, put the capital in place uh, to allow the the health uh, to allow for health system strengthening uh, for a country as a whole and for communities, um, and and for us that I'm going to build off this idea of the financial e ecosystem and how the different partners play into the different roles, um, you know, and I, and I see our good friends uh, from Caspian uh, Abhishek in here, and they're very much uh, a part of that ecosystem. So uh, and then um, uh, Aparna from from uh, you know, Asha Impact talking about blended finance. So first, when you're talking about um, the different players, it depends on the solution. So DFC, we provide, you know, um, uh, term loans, guarantees, equity investments um, to partner with the private sector to solve those critical uh, issues uh, in the healthcare sector. Um, so in that manner, we provide the, you know, longer term loans for the larger tertiary hospitals, um, we, you know, provide um, loans and guarantees for some of the medium enterprises, and then we also have a program for, for social enterprises. And what we've seen in the social enterprises is that it takes partnerships for, with uh, foundations, um, maybe high net worth individuals to provide those grants, um, you know, for, for blended finance. Um, we have partnerships with commercial banks. Um, Indus End is, is one of our, you know, great partners um, in, this, in this journey for development impact. Um, we can, the DFC can provide a guarantee, which provides um, a little bit of risk cover uh, for the commercial banks and enable, let's say, a rupee loan. And that rupee loan can be working capital for some of the smaller uh, businesses that, uh, you know, they, they have uh, rupee income, and they need uh, working capital in, in order to grow, um, purchase inventory, and, um, and pay their salaries. We, the DFC, are not best placed uh, to provide that working capital and then the back office to kind of um, uh, look after the inventory and the collateral um, that uh, review that needs to take place. Um, and, in, and in the second case, um, we could provide a guarantee against their, their rupee term loan. Uh, you know, there's, there's FX risk. DFC only provides US dollar funding. And um, we can actually introduce uh, that company to, to a commercial bank and they can avail themselves of, of the full suite of products that a commercial bank would have. So that's a partnership that we have through our, our guarantee product. Um, partnerships with NBFCs. You know, uh, NBFCs have um, 
like Caspian have um, very innovative methods and products um, for you know the, the um, level of financing, and and they're you know at the beginning part of the e ecosystem of doing the hard work of of working kind of side by side uh, with these smaller companies, right? And so if they can start uh, in, the, in the lending space where a company doesn't necessarily want to dilute um, their shareholding, um, we, we find uh, a lot of our, our business comes from, you know, handoffs, you know, Caspian was there. <laughs> and, and having Caspian there, for, for example, gives us the confidence that this is, you know, this is, this is a company that we, we want to invest in it as well. Um, so, so um, the, um, also partnerships with PE firms who do some of the, you know, upfront, um, and I'm talking about, you know, venture capital, um, those that do series A, um, but also seed, seed funding, um, as PE firms uh, that have put that initial capital at risk and uh, have identified good companies and are adding value with their consultants um, and, and management, and then DFC is able to pr provide that longer term 5, 10, 15 year loan to launch off of the, the risk capital already put out there uh, in equity terms. Um, and then lastly, you have you know, this, this concept of the development impact loan, uh, where, where um, you know, one, it, it's basically a loan, many have heard of, of development impact bond, but where the, the interest rate uh, on the loan can be can be lowered um, if the borrower meets a uh, certain impact criteria that's set out in, in the front, right? So you have the lender, uh, it's a partnership with the borrower, and then you need the foundation or, or grant maker that provides uh, that, that grant um, to, to offset the, the costs of the interest costs of the financial capital. And then the NGO or consultant to actually measure as a, an objective third party to measure the, the impact and see did that borrower meet those uh, those impact criteria. So partnerships, um, it takes a village, a financial and and financial village, and many of us are here uh, on this call thanks to Suncalp, which is another great partnership. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is uh, you put it very well, right? It needs a, it takes a financial village to build the health ecosystem. What is clear is that. The ecosystem has very specific roles and responsibilities that people are playing. To me, it looks look more like a four by 100 relay. The real question is how does the baton get passed uh, you know, without dropping it as we, as we finish the relay, right? Um, so at, at this point, you're, I would welcome um, uh, Samit, Rahul, and Manisha in that order to kind of add or give your thoughts on what, uh, what Ajay just said, which was very illuminating. And then I'll open it up to the other panelists for their views as well. Thanks, Dr. Nanda. Um, well, I think partnerships uh, is a given these days. Nothing can happen without collaboration. And you know, talking of health, I'm, I'm just reminded of Mother Teresa's quote, uh, which she had said, uh, the strength of the individual is the team and the strength of the team is the individual. So uh, it's, it's without saying that, you know, all of us need to work together to get things moving. And especially when we look at a country like India, which has a myriad of problems, uh, different solutions, different kind of uh, societies to deal with in different parts of the country. So there are these usual challenges, which the industry also faces from region to region. And uh, therefore, uh, partnerships like this help the industry substantially. And you know, given the COVID situation that we were all faced with, and I can say that the Samrid blended finance scheme that we got really helped us to rapidly scale, which was echoed by Rahul also. Uh, when we needed to set up a center in Hyderabad at very short notice for Dr. Reddy's and for the other vaccine players, it was this grant that you get, which enabled you to invest in that capex, which was required. Added with the working capital loans that Caspian and other banks extend to you. So, so that partnership really helped in getting it off the ground. And it's not just for now, it's for the future too. You know, the, the vaccines is not just the COVID vaccine. India has a huge immunization program going on, which needs the right kind of temperature control boxes that we do, for example. 
The other thing uh, which really helps the industry, it's, it's important that philan philanthropic grants have now moved away from just, let's say, NGOs to industry because sustainability is important. You know, you give a grant to do something good, it's very well needed, but to give it to an industry to help them continue doing it beyond uh, when you withdraw from that grant is equally important because grants are short-lived otherwise. But if an industry can use it well, it helps the industry to grow without even losing equity. So, so you're not, uh, it's, I think the grants are put to better use rather than, uh, just always giving it to, you know, doing something good for a short period at a village level. But then how do those villages take it forward further? So sustainability is something which industry and private enterprise brings in. And, um, and I think that's where the impact funds and all also do make a difference. So, so I think uh, it, it's a brilliant idea. And uh, Samrit and Caspian were there at the right time to help organizations like us just scale up and deliver. Thanks, Samit. Um, as, as Manisha and uh, Rahul, as you uh, think of your answers, there were two very interesting observations in the chat. Um, and, and Ajay and Rupa, this goes for you as well. The first one was, where, how do you see civil society organizations playing a role in this partnership and ecosystem? Uh, and the second one was that, uh, do you see blended finance in any way uh, supporting pre-seed capital for uh, social impact investment? So, so the, I'm just following the chat as well as we go along. So Rahul, over to you, and then Manisha, and then I'll, we'll open it up to the rest of the panel. Uh, Dr. Nanda, what I would say uh, in terms of partnerships, uh, honestly, logistics, uh, anyways, is an uh, integration of all the partners put together. So I would say the kind of partnerships which, were, uh, which we had and which we are currently working on, uh, we, had a, we had an entire impact in terms of uh, the people who are behind the supply chain, the people who are uh, in hospitals, the, the, the government bodies who are uh, involved. So partnerships, uh, while we talk about logistics and while we talk about the impact of supply chain, I think uh, the, the entire scenario uh, uh, had a very, very, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, during the critical time which we all saw, uh, everything was put together uh, in an impeccable way because uh, we had uh, people who worked day in and out to uh, get to uh, the beneficiaries that the remote is part of India's. And um, I think uh, we were able to create employment. We were uh, working and partnering with uh, daily wage workers who were like, during the lockdown had nothing else, but uh, uh, they were looking out for an opportunity to work for someone so we could create a uh, huge uh, impact in terms of employment to, to, the, uh, to the people. Uh, who required them. And uh, in terms of uh, our reach uh, to, to the most remote areas, uh, I would say uh, we partnered with the local people, the, the local uh, vaccinators, the local hospitals, the local health authorities. So that created an impact. So I would say without the partnership of local people all across state governments, health machineries, uh, the, the bankers, the finance companies, financial institutions, and especially the platform on which we are talking about, uh, it played an important role. Thanks, Rahul. Anisha, your, your thoughts? Uh, thanks, Dr. Nanda. I think we've uh, covered a lot of it, but for, for my perspective, the power of the partnership for blended finance is really bringing together not only the resources, but also the expertise of the different sectors, philanthropy, public sector, private sector, et cetera. Um, and I'll let, I'll let it slide, Ajay, but he didn't mention the DFC partnership with USAID. And we're so excited that DFC is now um, you know, a, a close partner of USAID and our Global Health Bureau. And, um, and in some of our recent partnerships, we've really played a role for providing TA or technical assistance or capacity building alongside the financial investments of, of the DFC and other um, of private impact investors. And so, for example, um, one of our recent partnerships in Africa that focused on providing a loan guarantee to the medical credit fund to expand uh, working capital loans for uh, private healthcare providers uh, and SMEs that were hard hit by COVID, 
as Rupa mentioned, you know, a lot of them were facing a, a liquidity crunch and that was um, happening in Africa as well. And so these working capital loans enabled them to continue providing essential services during COVID. But the medical credit fund also has a sister organization called Safe Care that provides some of the same technical uh, assistance and capacity building to these healthcare um, providers and SMEs, both on the health side, but also on uh, financial management. And you know, this may, they may be first-time borrowers; they um, may need some assistance in, in managing their business and financial operations. Um, and so, often USAID plays that role of supporting um, these enterprises with with TA and. and um, technical assistance and capacity building, which can help uh, round out the partnerships. Thanks, Manisha. And, and anyone else on the panel, Rupa, Abhishek, your thoughts on this partnership, question of partnerships? What I can say is that it's critical. Like, uh, I mean, the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Summit and uh, Ajay did mention us, uh, Caspian, having done some work. But the interesting thing is that uh, we are not just supported by uh, DFC USA, we are also supported by Indescent. So if I look at the panel, uh, the, the organizer of the panel uh, discussion in, in, indirectly, uh, and two panel members are working, uh, th three of us are working together to actually enable financing to the uh, you know target end clients, if I may. Uh, and I don't think it would have, been, would have been possible without all of us uh, coming in together because uh, like Rupa was mentioning, as a bank, uh, they have uh, certain types of uh, specializations or expertise. Uh, Ajay has uh, a, a specific types of uh, expertise. We have a different type of expertise. So if I try to do what Rupa does or uh, vice versa, or uh, Ajay tries to do what I do and, and vice versa, it will either be a disaster or uh, something will something or the other will not work. And if we really want the entire thing to work, it will happen only if uh, we work together. So uh, it's incredibly important. Thanks, Abhishek. So I'm going to put you on the spot for the next question. And the next question really is that what we are seeing, not just in India, but you know, in the US and around the world is the pandemic has actually highlighted some significant inequities and inefficiencies in the healthcare sector, right? And there's a lot of thinking about the future of the health system is going to be very different in a post pandemic environment. So if you were to look ahead, what do you see as some of the fundamental shifts and changes that will take place in the healthcare system and how do you see blended financing and the kind of partnerships that we've been talking about facilitate that transformation? Now, I, I understand that every single question that we're dealing with probably needs a three hour session of its own. And we're trying to wrap this up and I'm hoping that we'll have an opportunity to have multiple follow on conversations around this. So we shake over to you and then we'll have the discussions. Yeah. So in fact, uh, you know, I may want to uh, argue that it, it, it actually did not show the inequality as far as the healthcare lens is concerned. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, uh, am I audible? You're audible, but we can't see you. Um, okay, uh, let me just continue. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, if I may argue, I think the, uh, COVID situation uh, was actually a great equalizer. If you look at it from a healthcare perspective, it did not matter how much money you had. Uh, basically, if you did not get access to a bed or an or oxygen at the right time, uh, you, you know people died. So, in, in that sense, it was a great equalizer. But but you're right uh, that access to healthcare. Uh, was very different across uh, locations. So there were three things, at least to me, that uh, kind of uh, seemed to be very, uh, you know, key or important uh, that, that kind of came out. One is that, uh, you know, if you look at Indian healthcare system, uh, we follow a very pilgrimage mode of healthcare, uh, meaning that, you know, people would travel several st across several states and cities to go to that one doctor or one hospital where they think that they can get all the treatment. And all neighborhood, uh, you know, hospitals, clinics, and everything is 
uh, you know, they do not function as well. So you have most people going to Delhi or Hyderabad or Chennai uh, to get treated uh, from across the country. Now that clearly wasn't, uh, isn't going to work. Uh, it, it was always evident, but COVID made it clear that it wasn't going to work. Uh, and distributed access to healthcare was necessary. The second thing was that uh, healthcare is not just hospitals. Uh, it is everything from that small uh, thing you were putting on your fingers to measure the oxygen content in your blood to the mask, uh, to of course the hospital and the oxygen and the oxygen concentrators and so on. So there's a supply chain uh, of, uh, as far as healthcare is concerned. If you really want to fix healthcare, you have to work across the supply chain. Uh, the third thing that to me personally at least came out very clearly was insurance-led healthcare is, uh, you know, is, is falling short significantly. I mean, there's no way it can work at, uh, for, a, for a big country like us, for such a diverse country like us, at least for some years. Now, what does that mean? It means that investments have to be raised from different sources. But if you really look at, uh, you know, the Indian healthcare financing uh, system, uh, it is fa fragmented. Uh, uh, we had a mention of BIRAC somewhere in the presentation. And, you know, in the last few years, BIRAC has actually done a commendable job and a lot of new uh, innovations have come up in the healthcare sector. Uh, what is, however, problematic is that the investments into those kind of companies are not happening across different, you know, stages. So there, are, there is a bit of a seed grant happening. Uh, visibility uh, is there. But if you look at venture capital or private equity investments uh, in, over the last three years, especially last year, most of the investments have gone into much later stages and very large ticket sizes into much smaller number of companies. Now, what that means is that uh, the, traditional, uh, the traditional way of financing uh, isn't working, whether it is the venture capital way or, or, or whether it is the, uh, you know, the, the uh, bank financing way, both of which is kind of uh, falling uh, short. This is where, uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, uh, blended financing is going to work. And uh, so if you look at the way the blended financing work and the way in which, for example, Samrit has uh, worked, it, it, it essentially enabled us to uh, you know, kind of uh, work with companies like uh, uh, Plus that that Summit uh, you know runs to essentially create help them create the uh, cold chain for vaccines which was non-existent. And if Summit wouldn't have been there, that you know I, I don't know whether the vaccines would have reached the people. Uh, I mean, of course, and there are other companies like that of Summit that is working on this, but each one of them played a very critical role. And for them to be able to play that critical role, uh, uh, you know, we had to uh, work along with Samrit to get to that. Now, the point is the requirement for that supply chain, the cold chain, or the, you know, the small, you know, devices or the different types of diagnostic devices that BIRAC supported companies are creating, or the different models of healthcare through uh, telemedicine that has been innovated during COVID, all of that has been found out or kind of identified in a situation where we are we were going through a you know massive crisis, but it is also needed in a very normal uh, you know way of life as well. In my sense, like I said, venture capital mode or the traditional private equity venture capital mode may not be suitable for all uh, you know legs of the supply chain of healthcare. Uh, I think only blended finance can help because on the other side, we know that government financing is also not working. If it would have worked, we wouldn't have had the crisis that we saw in the last one year. So I think from, from that perspective, it is uh, requested uh, uh, that, uh, I mean, it, it, I think it is evident that we have to uh, kind of uh, work towards making sure that blended finance is uh, kind of available for all these different innovations over a period of time. Uh, so that's that's all that I wanted to say, Doctor uh, Nandakumar. Abhishek, you 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 kind of highlighted a very interesting point, right? You're, what you're saying is that the market is responding and evolving, uh, and the pandemic has actually accelerated the evolution and innovation in the market but the financing instruments and the financial institutions uh, are not able to keep up with the pace of change or are not. And there is a need 
to do business differently. And blended financing has the potential to kind of be the thread that weaves the transformation on the financing sector, on the financing side to support the transformation. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, this is my, you know, my, my simple take as a, as a non-expert in this space on what, on, on something that very profound thoughts that you, you had said. Uh, I hope I'm not misrepresenting you, Abhishek, at this point. Uh, no, you're not. That's a very good summary, actually. Okay. So, so Samit, um, you're the first discussant on this, and then I'm going to open it up to the rest of the panel. This is truly an amazing discussion that's taking place, and I'm learning so much, and I, from the chat, I can see some very robust conversations, and I think people are very pleased with the discussions. Samit, over to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I again uh, kind of repeat what Abhishek just said, uh, the blended finance enables smaller organizations like ours to be able to grow faster and therefore become, uh, you know, therefore we are then ready to take loans from the banks who are looking at some degree of uh, security in terms of, you know, how, uh, whether we You'll be able to take it forward, grow, etc. The other thing that will change and will is already beginning to happen is through these partnerships, access to other geographies becomes easier. And we will see a lot of these innovations from India actually go and impact countries like Latin America, Af Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, which are very similar in nature to what India is in terms of you know access to health or access to uh, technology or even uh, affordable technologies, which is the need of the R in all these countries. So this opportunity becomes easier for companies to kind of, you know, get access to blended finance and target uh, such uh, geographies. For example, you know, even IFC today is running a program called Tech Emerge, for example, which is also a grant driven uh, thing, but towards organizations which can create products that can take it forward. So I think a lot of these is beginning to happen. And as a result of COVID, it's speeding up because uh, there are, people have realized there are a lot of innovations within India itself that could solve the problem. I mean, we are the only country doing vaccination at rapid scale and it's, it's, there are so many of them which have started doing Covaxin or Sputnik or um, you know other vaccines. So it's it's happened because of the grants which even the government gave in a way. Uh, you know they gave advance orders with the money released, which typically doesn't happen. So so the financial access is becoming easier, and I think it will become easier in the years and days ahead. I mean, uh, we, uh, that that is. That is amazing. Uh, that advanced market commitments um, are, you know, are also a key component of the financing landscape. Uh, we have only 20 minutes left, apparently 15 minutes left. So I'm going to just uh, move to the last question, um, which is which kind of will wrap up the session. And really, we have talked about how important blended finance is, but what are some of the key challenges uh, facing blended finance uh, investments? Uh, in the Indian context. And Aparna, the, this question is to you. And the first discussant on that will be Manisha, but I would, after that, very much like for uh, Rupa, Jay, and Abhishek uh, as well to, you know, to uh, give your views. Uh, we have, I think, 15 minutes. So we'll keep the last two or three minutes for Arundhati to wrap up the session. Great. Aparna, over uh, to you. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Nanda. I think, uh, you know, we've touched upon some of the, the key challenges during the course of the discussions. I probably won't repeat those. I think Rupa, Ajay, Abhishek have all touched upon it, right? You have, um, you know, very complex and, and fragmented healthcare ecosystem in India, and obviously, like traditional sources of financing are not really able to, to help that. Um, and that's where, you know, we talked about the role of, of blended finance and how partnerships are, are key, not just from a, from a monetary or a resource perspective, but to open up market access, uh, you know, bring in the right kind of expertise as well. Um, I think though partnerships is a, is a double-edged uh, sword, right? So while I think it's absolutely important to have, you know, different players come in and, and bring in their expertise, um, I think that also, uh, you know, as they say, too many cooks spoil the broth sometimes. So when you have, 
you know, when you need a village, you know, so to speak, if I can borrow from, I think some of uh, the adverbs that were thrown around earlier, it also slows down some of the decision-making, some of the structuring. So while it's important, um, I think this is sort of the, the flip side of the coin, if I can, if I can say that. Um, so I think the need of the hour really is to understand, um, you know, how do you move away from bespoke structures to really, you know, trying to uh, templatize them, trying to scale them, which would also then help us address the costs that are associated with, uh, you know, structuring some of these instruments, uh, the time taken to bring these to market. Now, both Rahul and Samit, you know, talked about how quickly, um, you know, Samrit was really able to mobilize resources, whether it was from the commercial side, philanthropic side. So I think there's a very important role that intermediaries uh, play over here. You know, they're almost all like an investment bank bringing in different expertise, uh, you know, helping draft, uh, really helping firstly understand what is the problem that one is trying to address, because you can't just blindly apply, you know, one uh, instrument, um, you know, to, to a given problem, but firstly, like understanding, you know, what is the issue that you're trying to address, what part of the value chain are you trying to address, and what kind of financing solutions then can really be applied, and hence, what kind of capital needs to be to be brought in to really address that solution. So I think intermediaries, and I think Samrit has done that really well, you know, play that critical role of understanding the problem at hand, bringing in the right resources, bringing in the right expertise, and um, given the development challenge that we're talking about, I mean, right now this panel, of course, is focusing on healthcare, but this can, of course, be applied, um, you know, across. We've seen the pandemic give rise to a lot of other, you know, problems as well, like the whole migrant, uh, you know, issue that that came up, and we've seen other uh, facilities also come up, you know, to really help out on that. So I think um, just a couple of points. I think um, partnerships, of course, while they are key, we really need to work towards, you know, templatization so we can act at scale, um, you know, reduce costs, uh, reduce time, um, and then also, you know, see how uh, how more intermediaries can really be brought into the market. And then for that, obviously, you do need foundations and and maybe you know uh, DFCs, etc. To uh, play that that role of you know uh, helping build some of these organizations from scratch, providing them that seed capital to really uh, to bring them into the market. So I think those are some of the issues, and you know perhaps solutions. You can also look at um, you know innovation funds. Perhaps you know UK has been doing some of this as well. Uh, you know, mobilizing some funds from government, from, from foundations, from HNIs to see how can more such um, transactions or organizations really be seeded that can respond quickly to the ever-evolving, you know, market challenges. So I think, um, you know, perhaps those are some of the things that I would, I would say. And then Rupa already touched upon, you know, the role of, uh, you know, bringing in uh, philanthropic capital to either, you know, play that junior or, or mezzanine role or, you know, provide FLDG or provide guarantee structures, which can then help us crowd in a lot more commercial capital and balance the risk return spectrum as well uh, when one is looking at blended finance solutions. Thanks, Aparna. Monisha, you're, you're the discussant for this question, and then I'm going to open it up because this is, you know, a very important aspect of you know, what are the challenges and how do we kind of deal with it? Um, thanks, Dr. Nandan. Aparna covered it well. Um, just to add a couple of uh, additional points from my perspective, for the partnerships, I uh, completely agree that the governance structure is really important, that every partner has clear roles and responsibilities that are uh, tailored to the expertise that they can bring. And so for Example, um, you know, philanthropic partners may be able to move faster or are more flexible than some of the public sector partners or, or larger donors. Um, and so in the working capital model that I mentioned earlier, the partnership between USAID, DFC, and um, the Medical Credit Fund, uh, this, this partnership was called ODAFI or the Open Doors Africa Private Health Initiative. It also brought in the Health Finance Coalition, which is a um, includes a mix of leading philanthropists like the uh, Skoll Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation. And they were able to move more quickly to provide bridge financing to get the loans out the door um, while the broader loan guarantee was being established by USAID and DFC, which just takes a little bit uh, more time. 
And so having different partners who have different flexibilities or abilities um, to, to provide financing is can help with this uh, partnership structure as well. Um, and then I think more broadly, the two other points that I want to make. One is some of this just requires a bit of a culture shift for, especially for philanthropic and, and public sector or donors that may be not as used to working with um, private sector financiers. Um, and that culture shift requires, you know, new people, new processes, just new open-mindedness that, um, you know, take, takes time to establish. But it's great that there are more successful examples of blended finance these days. And, and I hope that that will help um, bring about some of that culture shift that's needed. And also some of this just takes additional um, practice and, and support and learning across these examples. And, and that's why USAID has, we have a, a blended finance roadmap that was created to support um, local uh, USAID missions and governments that are interested in, in applying blended finance to understand first the health challenge, um, as, as Aparna mentioned, really knowing what the issue is and then seeing what the financial challenges are, financing challenges, and then seeing you know, what's the appropriate financing tool um, and not jumping straight to here's an innovative or, or blended finance um, approach for the sake of it. Uh, so there are some, some of these tools out there that can help um, support partners that are trying out the blended finance approach uh, for the first time. And then finally, I, there's also a need for some of the policy or regulatory or ecosystem changes that are needed to complement uh, the financing in order for some of the social enterprises to really scale. And so, um, you know, that could take the form of uh, procurement or advanced market commitments that came up earlier to make sure that the products are, are then um, not only procured, but then distributed in the healthcare system. That could take, um, you know, support for research and development if this is a new product that needs regulatory or quality assurance approvals. Um, there's, there's a lot of different interventions that need to complement the financing to make sure that these, um, whatever products and services provided by the entrepreneurs are then scaled as quickly as possible. Um, and even more important in a, in a pandemic context. Thanks, so thanks, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Nanda. Thanks, Vanisha. Rupa, any final thoughts? One minute each. One minute. Um, just want to uh, 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 you know, supplement what Manisha spoke of, uh, regulatory issues. I think uh, CSR uh, end use, if it can be, uh, you know, today there are restrictions about using CSR for profit companies. So if regulators can look at that a little more flexibly, I think it will support uh, the blended finance uh, product overall. Uh, the second thing is, yes, it takes forever. And uh, Reserve Bank of India really does not recognize blended finance at all. Uh, it's not a word that they are uh, familiar with. So I think uh, there's, there's, there's some way to go uh, for it to get institutionalized so as to save it banks. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Ajay, one minute. Uh, nothing further. I think the others spoke you know, pretty eloquently on the topic. Thank, Thank you. you. Rahul, Samit. One minute each. I think Dr. Nanda, we uh, covered almost everything. And uh, while we are talking about the challenges, I would say they are uh, pretty much, uh, uh, could uh, list down almost all of them. And uh, we think the speed and uh, the kind of, uh, also the timelines uh, of these kind of uh, schemes, uh, I would say um, from a, with the timeline perspective, if we can go beyond two years to five years to long term, because while we are dealing with uh, addressing some of the infrastructure issues, um, we need to, uh, uh, because this is an ongoing process, uh, it's not about a 12 to 18 months or a 24 months program, but if we can work out and um, extend the timelines and keep it ongoing for a long term, and that will happen when uh, uh, collaborative effort from multiple people getting in and as uh, uh, Rupa has uh, correctly mentioned, that CSR and other things can also blend in. They'll play an important role. Now, what do you say? Yeah, Samit, you're, a minute for you, and then Aparna, you had your hand up, and then I'm going to hand it off to Arundhati to wrap up. 
I, I really don't have anything more to add. I think uh, philanthropic funding for commercial uh, you, uh, applications like ours would definitely play a role. And I think as Rupa mentioned, if CSR can also be directed towards that, it will it will really make a lot of difference because resilience can only come in when there is sustainability in the whole system. So that's it. Parma, you had you had your hand yeah. up. Yeah, I think just, you know, quickly, uh, you know, also wanted to end on a positive note to say, uh, you know, while there are regulatory challenges and, you know, Rupa mentioned CSR and, you know, when foreign capital is, you know, trying to come in, we have a whole lot of FCRE and, you know, FEMA issues, et cetera. But um, I think that the one positive here is definitely with the social stock exchange that the government, uh, you know, has announced and, you know, Sebi just uh, recently has also released, uh, you know, a report on it. Um, I think there's definitely something to look forward to, and we will see more sort of blended finance, um, you know, come to the forefront. And you know, especially things like the social stock exchange will definitely help enable some of this to happen at at scale as well. Thanks. Uh, so a big thank you from my side to all the all the panelists. And what I took away, I'll try to summarize in uh, in less than a minute, is that the the health ecosystem is very complex and you have different layers at different levels of maturity and different risk profiles. Uh, it takes a financing village, uh, Ajay, to quote you, as uh, to make this happen, but a village necessarily requires everybody to work in partnership and the partnership is not always easy to pull off because there are specific roles and responsibilities. Um, and, and, and the health sector seems to be innovating and moving much quicker and faster uh, then the financing instruments and the financial sector is able to keep, keep up. Uh, overarching this, uh, there is the policy environment that has to facilitate the use of blended financing and innovative financing as a way to catalyze right, investments in the health sector and, and, and facilitate the creation of the health sector of the future in India. Uh, it, this is, uh, you know, thank you so much for an incredibly rich discussion. It was really an honor and a privilege to moderate this panel. And I have learned a lot as I'm sure everybody who has been listening in. So Arundhati, two minutes left, over to you to wrap up. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nandan. Uh, thanks everyone for that insightful discussion. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the discussion today and I'm sure there's a lot that needs to be uh, you know, thought about as we navigate the way ahead. Um, we would like to thank all of you for attending the session, and we hope to welcome you at some of the other insightful sessions in Sankar 2021 and beyond. Um, I would also like to thank the audience who've been patiently listening to the conversation. There are a lot of uh, uh, questions on the chat, and um, some of them got answered on the way, but we would like to also share that later with the uh, panelist speakers to kind of answer them later and get back to the uh, audience uh, with the answers. Uh, I would like to extend my thanks to the program partner, Samrit Team, uh, uh, which is supported by uh, USAID uh, for curating this session at uh, uh, Sankalp. Um, look forward to uh, many more engagements on Sankalp platform with all of you. Thank you uh, very much for uh, taking our time for today's session and have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time.